from the Yeti of the snow-peaked Himalayas to the Almasti of Russia and the Sasquatch of the Western USA. Every culture has a name for it. But this series isn't about hunting for Bigfoot. It's about hunting for answers. Bigfoot believers claim they have evidence to support its existence. The problem is that none of it has ever been properly substantiated. But can science, cutting edge science, actually sort out fact from fiction? Well, a professor of genetics at Oxford University is determined to find out, and I'm going to help him. That Oxford professor, Brian Sykes, has launched a unique project, testing samples of Bigfoot hair from all over the world. We will definitely be able to identify the species origin of any sample. So if there's anything really exciting, we will find it. I've been on the trail of Sasquatch with America's Bigfootologists. And in the Himalayas, our tests revealed the likely identity of the Yeti. Now, I'm in Russia, home to the Almasti. In Siberia, I'll meet a formidable Almasti hunter. And the kids who may have caught the Almasti on camera. I'll be testing the descendants of a so-called Neanderthal wild woman. And I'll locate the skull that could unlock the Almasti's secrets. And meet the man who dug it up. These creatures can speak. We're undertaking the most comprehensive DNA analysis of Bigfoot ever attempted. Whatever the answer, it's judgment day for Russia's Almasti. <laughs> Nearly 6,000 miles from east to west, spanning nine time zones, Russia is the largest country on the planet. Hard to imagine a more perfect habitat for the Russian Bigfoot. There are plenty of theories about Bigfoot. For many believers, they're giant apes of some sort, but unknown to science. The skeptics, on the other hand, point towards misidentifications, and bears are top of the list. And of course, the whole Bigfoot thing could be a series of elaborate hoaxes. But here in Russia, they're convinced by what is arguably the most fascinating and outlandish of theories. And that's that the Russian Almastis are 21st century survivors of one or more of our ancient human-like relatives, possibly even surviving Neanderthals. And they're equally convinced they've got the evidence to prove it. Over the last 300 years, there have been thousands of sightings, from the Caucasus to the Volga from the Urals to central and eastern Siberia and the frozen Arctic north. Almasti translates as wild man. It is human-like, five to seven feet tall, two to 400 pounds in weight, hairy from red to beige, brown, to black. But hard evidence remains as elusive as ever. Now a top scientist is taking it on. Oxford University's <laughs> Professor Brian Sykes is one of the world's leading geneticists. In 2012, he launched the most ambitious Bigfoot DNA study ever seen and is testing so-called Almasti hares from all over Russia. It's only in very recent years that technology's come on enough to do this project properly. I think it's fair to say that no serious scientist 
has looked into this field for the last 50 years. While Brian begins his analysis, I'm travelling 1,500 miles to Russia itself. I'll be meeting the key hair donors to his project and testing human subjects to see just how Neanderthal the Russians are. I've got two big journeys ahead of me, one south to the Caucasus and the other east to Siberia, to try to get to the truth about the Almasti. But first, I've got some very important business right here in Moscow. I'm on my way to the monthly meeting of the world's longest-running Bigfoot group, Moscow's Relic Hominoid Society. The group's veterans are en route too. Between them, Igor Burtsev, Dmitry Bayanov and Michael Trachtengertz have clocked up 130 years' worth of Almasti hunting. The group always meets at Moscow's Darwin Museum of Evolution, an appropriate location given their enthusiasm for the Almasti Neanderthal theory. The idea was developed 50 years ago by Professor Boris Porshnev, who did much of his work in the Caucasus in southern Russia, a place rich in Neanderthal finds. Porshnev died without proving his theory, but his followers are full of hope for Brian's project. I'm just hopeful that his genetic findings will confirm, uh, will support the existence of these creatures. I think that there are hundreds of such creatures on the territory of uh, uh, former USSR. If Dr. Sykes says that they, they are Neanderthals, that means Professor Porshnev's theory 100% uh, um, real. But is it plausible? It's thought that Neanderthals died out 30,000 years ago, outcompeted by modern humans. But why couldn't scattered groups of them have survived, say the Almasti hunters? In the vastness of Russia. I'm intrigued by what evidence they've got to support what is a pretty bold claim, and particularly what physical evidence they've got that Brian and I can test. To find out, I'm travelling a thousand miles south to the Caucasus, where Porshnev developed his Neanderthal theory. But my destination, Abkhazia, is far from easy to get into. The reason this border crossing is so controversial and tricky to navigate is because Abkhazia is a breakaway state. It's not really a country. It's recognised by Russia, but pretty much nobody else. Abkhazia is officially part of the Republic of Georgia, but declared its independence in 1992. Years of on and off war ensued. Now there's a tense, uneasy stalemate. Thousands cross here every day, but foreign film crews are very rare. We're all a bit nervous, including our driver. Quite what's gonna happen, I don't know. But I have the words of the Foreign Office ringing in my ears right now. They advise British citizens against all travel to Abkhazia citing the risk of arrest, terrorism, and unexploded ordnance. There were questions, searches, and lots and lots of paperwork. 
but finally, we were through. That only took six and a half hours. <laughs> I'm here to investigate the most high-profile story in Russian Bigfootology, the tale of Zana, the so-called wild woman of the Caucasus. For Almasty hunters, it is the big story. And the question is, was she Neanderthal? Was she an Almasty? We shall see. The story begins, it's said, in the remote forests of Abkhazia, sometime in the 1870s. Two men are chasing down a wild, hairy creature, perhaps half animal, half human. They beat it into submission, tie it up, drag it back to a nearby village and present it to the local landowner. The creature is Zana. I'm on the trail of Zana with one of Russia's younger Almasty hunters. Dmitry Perkolov. The story began in the 70s of the 19th century. A former engineer turned film producer, he's been obsessed with the story for many years. Zana the Wild Woman, caught in an area rich in Neanderthal archaeology, is said to have died in the 1890s. The pioneers of Russian Bigfootology Porshnev and others first heard of Zana in the early 1960s when locals told them the tale. Her wildness and the Neanderthal associations of the area seemed to fit the Almasty Neanderthal theory perfectly. Over the last 50 years, the story has grown into one of the most celebrated in global Bigfootology. But the truth about Zana's identity remains unresolved. Dimitri's taking me to Tekina, where she's said to have been imprisoned by the local landowner in the 1870s. The ghostly village is half abandoned. At its heart, where her jailer's house probably stood, is the old Communist Party headquarters. Is this derelict now? Can we have a look yes, inside? Yes, you can go inside. Yeah, yeah. Wow, look at that. We've got Karl Marx. Yes. Engels. Friedrich Engels. Lenin. Lenin. And, and Stalin. Stalin. Wow. Oh, my word, look at this. For many Abkhazians, the days of the old USSR are seen as a time of turmoil. And it wasn't much different in Zana's day. The Muslim Ottoman Empire controlled Abkhazia for centuries. Then the Russians took them on, seizing the place not long before Zana's capture. The Russian Empire itself was hardly stable, though. After five previous attempts on his life, the Tsar was killed by a bomb in 1881. It gives a bit of context to this dark, troubling tale of Zana's years of imprisonment in this somewhat lawless place. But the real shock was still to come. Dimitri told me that during the 20 or so years she's said to have spent here, Zana had four children. I mean, I assume this was rape, was it? I mean, uh, she, she wouldn't have consented. Uh, perhaps. Perhaps, but it was a part of Caucasus. It was a pretty wild territory, probably because uh, they were also crazy. Nobody knows. But we absolutely know that she had children from so local... That is, that is yes, definitely, that is definitely yeah. absolutely the case. 
Dr. Igor Burtsev, one of the three wise men of Russian Almasty hunting, and a highly respected figure in international Bigfootology, has been working on the Zana story for 40 years and paints a dark picture of how the landowner, Edgi Ganaba, might have orchestrated all this. Some people arrange some parties uh, with drinking, with uh, joking between men, and they are um, uh, just uh, playing. Uh, and sometimes this Ganaba uh, offered uh, this woman that is why uh, some uh, local men had uh, sex with her. Descriptions of Zana, Dmitri told me, came from elderly eyewitnesses who remembered her from when they were young I mean, she used to come down then from and were interviewed by researchers like Bertsev. When I was there in 1971, I met with one uh, eyewitness of Zana. He remembered her when he was an eight-year-old uh, boy. He saw her. Dana was very big, strong. All her body was uh, covered with hairs, a short neck, very protruding jaw. She was a wild woman. But what kind of wild woman? A surviving Neanderthal? Another hominid? Or an unfortunate abused human? Brian hopes to unlock the secrets of her identity through the DNA of her descendants. The Almasti hunters have spent years tracking them down and producing an extraordinary document. Zana's family tree. Igor Burtsev started to do this maybe 40 years ago, and uh, I continued. Right now, we spent about five years only to check all descendants. I mean, there's a huge amount of information on here. So what, what are the highlights? We absolutely knew that she had four children, two daughters and two sons. The oldest one, Jonda, and the youngest was Sweet. Taking the baton from Igor Burtsev, Dmitri has spent half a decade tracking down more of Zana's descendants. The results were interesting that some of them didn't have any idea about their relations. It was really nice for them to, to know who they are. You've put so much effort into this over such a long time. It begs the question, why? What's, what's the fascination for you personally? Uh, you, you know, the first time I heard about this story when I was a little boy, because I was uh, born in Georgia, in Bilusi, not far from here, and we knew about this story. And uh, through this tree, we can find out our roots, you know, uh, making DNA tests and uh, scientifically Proof the theory of modern Neanderthal or wild man or anything else. So, so across the whole world, in terms of cryptozoology and the fascination with Bigfoot, Zana is the key character. Right. That's, right. That's, that's and, incredible. And the closest, the closest way to uh, prove our theory. Three months ago, Dmitri collected saliva samples from four of Zana's relatives and sent them off to Brian. Zana's history can be read in their DNA, and the analysis is underway. Now, Dmitri's located another two descendants who are happy to be tested. First up, Rodion, Zana's great-great-grandson. Like so many Abkhazians, Rodion bears the scars of the recent past. He lost an eye in the war with Georgia, and he lost his son too. Здравствуйте. 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 Здравств
Can you ask Rodion how proud is he that he is a relative of Zana? Пусть знает все мира, что я являюсь третьим поколением сестра и брат Хутин предков Зани. Почему я должен стесняться? Почему я должен стесняться? I also wanted to hear about Quit, Zana's son, and Rodian's great uncle. Quit was very strong man. His son, young man. With a very long hair. Six foot five, six foot five. He is easily able to be seen by people. He is easily able to be seen by people. He is easily able to be seen by people. With his teeth. Yes. So the table here, and you go, and dance, oh, oh, oh. yes, and dance, and Metro dance, Piat. and hold the table out. Hold the table and dance. So you need to spit. Brian needs both saliva and cheek cell swabs. Perfect. To give him the best possible picture of each relative's DNA. Our last call was to a fourth generation descendant. Indira, Zana's great, great, great granddaughter, and a grandmother herself, at just 39. It's okay, I won't hurt you, I promise. These samples will reveal the percentage of Neanderthal DNA in Zana's descendants, and therefore how Neanderthal Zana herself was. It's cutting edge science. The Neanderthal genome was only sequenced in 2010 and contained a huge surprise, that many humans contain Neanderthal DNA, meaning the two species interbred. One of the most remarkable aspects of that sequence was that in Europeans and in Asians, there was a substantial component, two to four percent, of DNA that had been inherited from Neanderthals by interbreeding. If Zana was a surviving Neanderthal, then her descendants will have a much higher percentage than 2 to 4%. And Brian has one more sample for testing, a tooth from the skull of Quit himself. In 1971, Igor Burtseff located the long-abandoned, overgrown graveyard where Quit was said to be buried. And after days of digging, he found his remains. I personally arranged the excavations. It was very heavy man. He was very tall. And we just assumed quit skull. It's a vital addition to the tests on the descendants because it contains Zana's mitochondrial DNA. This is passed on only through the female line and is the key to understanding Zana's ancestry. This is Quit, son of Zana, missing a molar tooth, because that's the tooth that Brian's already tested for DNA. And I tell you what, it does feel a bit weird, having learnt so much about this guy and his mum, to now be holding his head in my hands, especially when you look at him eye to eye, it's incredible to think with the results of the analysis of the DNA of his tooth, we may well be able to unravel a mystery that has perplexed the Bigfoot world for 50 years. I'm on the last leg of my journey, traveling 2,000 miles east to Siberia. Once home to the notorious gulags, it's the least populated part of Russia. Here, the population density is just eight human beings per square mile. In Britain, it's 660. And with that in mind, it's perhaps easier to believe that there could be creatures unknown to science living out here, possibly even surviving Neanderthals. 
Western Siberia is said to be Russia's Almasty hotspot. Though here, they call it Yeti or Snowman. I'm heading towards the little town of Tashtagol to meet up with Dr. Igor Burtsev, Russia's foremost Almasty hunter. And they come here only in summertime. He has high hopes for the Siberian hair samples that he sent to Brian. And we're off to see the family who gave them to him. The Kungashevs are from the Shores tribe, native Siberians who were here long before the Russians came. And near their cabin in the woods in the winter of 2011, they found something remarkable. <laughs> Заряжаемся вот этой энергией нашей природы. Снег белоснежный лежит, а мой супруг Юрий идет и смотрит. Я за, я сам последний шел, сзади шел. Я вот шел и думал, чтобы детям, ну, показать вот маленькие следы там, возможно зайцев, возможно мышей, там лиса вот у нас здесь вот следы нет, не попадают. И вдруг он говорит: "Смотрите, что за следы идут". Вначале думали, это медведь. Медведь, когда идет, у него когти торчат, они не прячутся, и он землю выковыривает. И Юра говорит, нет, это не медведь. Все, они раз быстренько подошли сюда. И вот старшая дочь, она взяла телефон у матери и говорит, давай снимать. И говорит, вот следы ети, следы ети, следы ети. Ужасно, какие большие шаги. Нифига человеческие. Вот как. Вот. И мы стали следовать этим следам. Но это было жутко, жутко было страшно. Сразу же мурашки по телу, как говорится, волосы дыбом стали. Девочки, конечно, говорят, мама, я боюсь. Страшно, я обратно. А медведь? Да не страшно, нет, это не медведь. Были необычные следы. Но потом, когда мама с папой сказали, что ну, страшно за нас стало, мне тоже страшно стало. Ну, нам всем стало страшно. So where were the first prints? Вот, вот здесь вот, вот здесь вот прямо, вот сюда, вот оттуда сюда. The footprints вот так вот спустился, вот так вот выше, и вот так посмотрел, так вот, и все, и, и так пошел, туда пошел. Вдоль дороги, вот тут метров двадцать. And then we carry on. А где мерили девчонки, где мерили? Вот тут вот, примерно. Вот They measured вот. Да, вот, вот, вот рядышком, вот здесь yeah. вот. They measured вот, Фотография here. вот здесь вот. So from here, so from there to there, that was the total size of the print. Okay. Yeah, let's go. The Kungashevs followed the giant 14-inch tracks as far as the river, which the creature seemed to have leapt in one bound. So where did you find the hair? Four of those hairs have gone to Brian for testing, and the Kungashev's hopes are high. We hope, on behalf of you, that we will be able to find the hair. Our family hopes that these hairs belong to this creature, belong to this being. I wanted to get a clearer picture of this creature. Bertsev told me that he'd never seen one himself, but that he'd learned a lot from the thousands of witnesses he had interviewed. The main difference between man and animal is speech. These uh, creatures can speak and even can understand uh, speech of humans, just their speech is more quick than humans. They do so. What did, that, they say, what did that mean? They punish uh, youngsters. So that's telling, they prank, that's, prank. That's telling off a youngster? Yes. So you haven't seen the creature? 
but other people have seen the creature. Yes. So is a there... lot of people. We have uh, some about uh, ten thousand uh, encounters. I know you could give me endless yes. stories of yes. encounters, but I, the the problem I have, Igor, is coming to this fresh and and exploring the world that you work in. Why has nobody taken a photograph? It uh, has the paranormal abilities. That the what ability? Paranormal. The paranormal abilities. Paranormal. If they don't like you to come too close to him, he will just stop you and you cannot move. You start to look around and after, oh, behind that tree, there is a creature, big hairy creature standing there. And after that, he understands who bothered him mentally. Telepathic or not, the Almasti is certainly elusive. So I could see why Igor wanted to travel 100 miles north to the little village of Rusko Ersky to check out the most talked about sighting of recent times. These three boys, Zenya, Kirill and Sasha, filmed a mystery creature on a camera phone in January 2013. And Bert, Sef and I are not the only ones who are interested. A bigger beast is on his way. No less than the region's Duma deputy, equivalent of an MP. For this little community of Roscoe Ersky, this is the equivalent of a royal visit, let me tell you. The Duma deputy? Well, all I can say is that he is a larger-than-life character and he's well-known for throwing his weight about. Here you go. Dobry dzień. Dzień dobry. Dobry dzień, Mark, Nikolai. Nikolai, it's good. Good to see you. Я тоже очень рад вас видеть. This is good. Can we take a look yes, now? Yeah, yes. is that okay? Yeah, we, we follow you in. Yeah. Once known as the Beast from the East, Nikolai Valuev is a former heavyweight boxing champion of the world. Now turned advertising poster boy, politician, and enthusiastic Almasti hunter. At seven feet tall and well over 20 stone, it's no surprise that many Russians call him a living Neanderthal. We have the video on here. Video Nikolai Zavut. Valuev takes a keen interest in all matters Almastian in his constituency and is as keen as we are to check out the boys and their video. OK, here we, here we go. In their film, the three friends follow a set of mystery footprints to the edge of a frozen lake, <laughs> laughing and joking as they go. <laughs> and then they see something extraordinary. A tall, dark, hairy figure that seems to see them and dart away. What does Nikolai think of it? For this this bit here, when we see the when we see the creature. Ну, я сам сейчас немножко в шоке. Как получилось, что следы ты наметили? Мы подошли ближе, смотрим, а потом Боб посмотрел Женька, говорит, смотрите следы. Ну мы пошли туда по этим следам и камеру. Мы когда подошли, ну следы было его не видно. Он потом из из кустов там не видно было. Он потом вышел на нас как маленечко посмотрел, у него лицо здесь. Такой белый, лысый, волос не было такого. 
Ну, было видно, как быстро побежали. -то. Страшно было. Да. In their alarm, the boys are swearing a lot. And in this rather conservative country, they've already had a serious telling off from the local police. Когда домой прибежали сразу взрослым, да. Ну, а сбивающим что... сами на 10 раз пересмотрели и показали. Question is, does Nikolai think this is the most exciting Almasti evidence in recent times? Or a fake? Если бы это был сценарий, то это была бы подготовленная акция, и дети бы не, а, не были бы в возбужденном состоянии. А у нас есть а, народ коренной шорцы, которые жили в Таштагольском районе, бог знает сколько, сотен лет живут. И так или иначе, в тайге там а, случаи такие были, и вроде как и происходят. Но у них... Ребятам нужно только спасибо сказать, что у них хватило смелости пойти и заснять это существо. На самом деле они дети, и это очень страшно даже для взрослого человека. Так, по большому счету. So one more question. Is that a snowman? Судя по увиденному, реакция быстрая была. Потому что действительно существо резко, резко убежало. Ну, Можете однозначно сказать. здесь не медведь. Finally, definitely not bear. Спасибо вам за вашу смелость. Спасибо. Держите руки. Спасибо. Ну и давайте так. Мы договариваемся, да? Вы больше не ругаетесь. Обещаете? Книжки будете читать. Да. Чтобы не ругаться никогда. Приеду, проверю. Молодцы. Николай seemed convinced by the video. And if it is a fake, it's a pretty good one carried out by three young kids in the back of beyond. Point is though, it's impossible to prove. There are no samples, nothing to test. That's why Brian has launched this project, to get definitive answers. And soon we'll know them, because the tests are complete. And the professor has come to Moscow. It's results day. The professor and I, the three wise men, and their young disciple, Perkolov, are all converging on the Darwin Museum. You have all, in your different ways, been extremely helpful to this project. The project would get nowhere if people like yourselves didn't donate samples. So thank you very much indeed. First up was Michael Trachtengertz, who'd given Brian four of the most promising samples from the archives of the society, some of them over 40 years old. Two of them proved to be horse, one cow, and the fourth wasn't hair at all, but a piece of glass fiber. Next, it was the Kungashev's hair, that high hope sample from the Tashtagol. Brian's tests revealed that it was a brown bear. Bertsev didn't take it lying down. I don't believe it. You don't believe it? No. Why not? Because I was not sure that they, are, uh, they were of Kungushev's because uh, I had a lot of samples and they could be mixed. I could sense Bertsev's tension and everyone else's too, as we approached the last and biggest question of this Russian journey. Zana. Brian, of course, had tested Quit's tooth, as well as the six sets of saliva and swabs from Zana's descendants. Would the 50-year-old Porshnev Neanderthal theory be born out or thrown out? The results from the Neanderthal DNA test were that all of the six descendants of Zana had the same amount of Neanderthal DNA as everybody else, about 2.8%. So we can say without uh, fear of contradiction that Zana 
was not a Neanderthal. It's a definitive answer. The faces in the room were impassive, hard to read. But the big news was yet to come. Having got the results back on the descendants, I went back to have a detailed look at the DNA that I got from the Kvitz tooth. And sure enough, that wasn't Neanderthal, as, and that wasn't unexpected. But what was unexpected was that when I looked at the detail of her mitochondrial DNA, it was sub-Saharan Africa. Oh. Sub-Saharan Africa. It makes sense now. So, Though Perkalov says it all makes sense, it's an extraordinary result. Bertsev looked pensive, as Brian explained that the DNA from Quit's tooth showed definitively that his mother Zana's maternal ancestry was sub-Saharan African. That means south of the Sahara, black African. But what did the DNA of her living descendants show? So then I thought, in that case, perhaps I can find African DNA in the descendants. All of them have got sub-Saharan African DNA in their genomes in about the right proportions that you would expect from the results. Zana was 100% sub-Saharan African. What's the explanation? All the possibilities are uncomfortable, given what happened to Zana. Likeliest is that she or her forebears were brought from Africa to Abkhazia as slaves when it was part of the slave-trading Ottoman Empire to work as servants or laborers. The Russians ended slavery when they took over, but the writer Maxim Gorky visited Abkhazia in the 1920s and wrote that there were still Africans living there. Was Zana an African who'd stayed behind? Was she kidnapped? Or was she really living wild in the mountains? When Brian and I discussed it, we both agreed that the slave theory, however uncomfortable, was the most likely solution. But Brian had spent some of the night before carefully examining Quit's skull and noticed some unusual features very wide eye sockets and an elevated brow ridge that could suggest ancient as opposed to modern human origins. And he was starting to toy with a thought-provoking alternative notion. Maybe she isn't an African of recent origin at all, but one from a migration out of Africa many thousands, perhaps tens of thousands of years ago, and that she comes from a relic population um, taking refuge in the Caucasus Mountains. Whichever explanation is the right one, and maybe there are some we haven't thought of, um, they're all going to be pretty unlikely, but they must be true somewhere. There must be an explanation for that 100% African DNA in Zama herself. It's a radical thought, but it strikes a chord with Dr. Bertseff who recalls the excitement of a Moscow anthropologist when he first showed him Quit's skull several years ago. When he saw that skull, he was just astonished. There is an association of a very uh, primitive uh, features of this, on this skull and very progressive features. This mix of primitive and modern features is intriguing. But could Zana really have been a relic of an unknown branch of Homo sapiens from an early migration out of Africa? It's possible, but unlikely. If it were true, though, then the Almasti hunters from Porshnev to the present would have been right all along about a surviving, unknown hominid living in the wilds of Russia. And what about Zana herself? Maybe she was wild, hairy and strong, 
Or did her appearance get embellished into a kind of folklore of a monster by guilty villagers who knew that a terrible wrong had been done? I now find myself thinking a lot about Zana and what she went through as a human being. And it's pretty dark stuff, even for Abkhazia in the 1800s. But it is an answer, even if it's an uncomfortable one. And that's the whole point of this project. We've wanted to use science to get to the truth. And finding out who Zana was is a massive result. I'm reflecting back too on this whole journey. From Everest Base Camp in Nepal, to Brutus the Bear and the Shipton footprint and the amazing DNA result that suggested a likely solution to the Yeti question, to the USA, where the will to believe seems to drive the world of Bigfootology. And back to my very first meeting with Brian, when I asked what drew him to the murky world of Bigfoot. I'm really doing it because I'm curious. I want to know the answer, and that should be the basis for any scientific investigation. That curiosity, that wish to know, has really paid off. Brian has, I think, done something extraordinary. He's managed to turn a slightly crazy, controversial fringe pursuit, a world of myth and legend, into a science. And that is a massive achievement and a lasting legacy. Kicking off our secret history strand next Sunday at 8, we investigate the mystery surrounding Tutankhamun's death and look at new evidence about his burnt mummy. Now, think of this as your two-minute warning. Nip to the loo, turn your phone off, go make a warm beverage. Homeland is next.